Hello everyone. This week on We Talk Nerdy, I've got tech news of the week. I have an email about music on Android, and I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about LastPass. So stay tuned. We Talk Nerdy. WeTalkNerdy.tv is sponsored by UBU Enterprises, specializing in custom business website design, social media marketing, and online branding strategies for companies and products. Before I get started, I have some programming issues I'd like to discuss. As you may know, uh, this is my first episode in a couple of weeks, and my housing situation has changed a bit, and I've been busy dealing with that. I've got a new for show for you this week, uh, but I've got a vacation coming up later this month, so I'm not really sure when the next show is going to be. Beyond that, I've come to the realization that going forward, I'm probably only going to be able to do a show once every two weeks. Producing this show takes a lot of time and effort on my part, and I need some time in between shows to work on various projects. I would rather do fewer shows uh, than let the quality of the show decline. So bottom line, this is episode 10. I'm not really sure when I'll have episode 11 ready, uh, but I'm going to continue producing shows as best I can. Uh, please visit wetalknerdy.tv for status updates and of course my latest uh, take on the tech news. Now in this week's tech news, uh, Tony Bradley over at Forbes wrote an article called Intel Haswell Chips and Windows 8.1 could revive the waning PC market. Uh, I think he's got it all wrong, um, but let's back up just a bit. Uh, if you're not familiar, Haswell is Intel's code name for uh, their new line of processors. Uh, Intel designed the Haswell architecture uh, to be more power efi efficient, which is great. Unfortunately, it's only marginally more powerful than the previous line of chips that they created. Uh, they needed to do this in order to compete in the mobile marketplace. Most of the mobile devices out in the world right now uh, don't have Intel inside. Uh, they use a processor called ARM. Uh, this is great news for laptop and tablet makers who want to use uh, Intel processors. Uh, and this especially includes Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft introduced their own line of tablet PC last year called the Surface RT, and they had introduced another product called the Surface Pro. Um, sales of the Surface RT pretty much tanked. Um, the RT tablet was based on that ARM processor I was telling you about, and as such, it didn't run regular PC programs. Um, I kind of predict that the uh, Surface RT will quietly go away eventually, and Microsoft will just kind of pretend like it never happened. The Surface Pro, on the other hand, uh, has done better in the market, but not great. It uses uh, Intel uh, x86 processors, um, but it's kind of a power hog because the uh, current line of processors is not really designed um, with power savings in mind. Uh, the uh, Surface Pro can run regular PC programs, but it's sluggish graphics performance and it has terrible battery life. Uh, the new Haswell chips will make the Surface Pro uh, more attractive, and if Microsoft can offer up some improvements in Windows 8.1, uh, they may sell better. Uh, but the truth for Microsoft is that Windows 8 is not well loved, and Microsoft is well entrenched in the marketplace, in the enterprise marketplace, but I don't think they can really compete very well in the tablet market. People love their iPads and their Android tablets. Many of those people are rather irrational about it. Um, and folks merely tolerate Windows. Has anyone ever really camped out in front of a Microsoft store waiting for a Microsoft product release? No, but Apple has had that. And uh, I think the Surface Pro will do fine with businesses and people who want or need uh, Microsoft Office, but everybody else has already moved on. Microsoft made their fortune being the 800-pound gorilla of business, not by being cool and alternative like Apple. I just don't see Microsoft ever capturing hearts and minds the way Apple has. Mobile devices like tablets and phones will continue to increase in popularity, um, while laptops and PCs uh, may continue to decline. Uh, the PC market is fairly well, fairly well saturated. Uh, most people already have a computer that does what they need it to do. I don't think Microsoft 
I don't think anything that Microsoft can do will really change that. The market's evolving. Apple, Microsoft, and Intel will do just fine for a while. Um, Intel certainly has the resources to continue to be the, number, the world's number one chip manufacturer. Uh, but as for Microsoft and Apple, I think they have a real problem on their hands. And quite frankly, if things continue the way they're going, I think Google will crush them both. Um, I'll talk about that more in more detail at some point, but consider that Apple released the iPhone in uh, 2007. Uh, I bought one at the time, and I thought it was one of the most exciting and innovative products I'd ever seen. Uh, Google released the first Android phone uh, a full 16 months later, and it was actually pretty bad compared to the iPhone. Today, Android is now the number one smartphone platform worldwide, and Google gives away their pro best products for free. Um, those products are not just free, they're really, really good. And going forward, I believe Microsoft and Apple will have a hard time competing with free. So moving on, uh, last week news surfaced about the NSA's PRISM program. You may have heard people talking about it. Um, PRISM program uh, was released or leaked to the press in the form of a PowerPoint document. A guy named Glenn Greenwald uh, of The Guardian first broke the story which alleges that the National Security Agency has a wide-ranging program to spy on Americans uh, through monitoring cell phone records and emails. And for the record, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, and others have all denied that this is going on. Uh, I wish I could say that I was surprised by this, uh, but I'm not. Uh, this is a technology show, and I do my best to keep politics out of it, but there are some stories like this one where politics and technology intersect. In my opinion, since 9-11, the powers that be, whoever they are, have engaged in a systematic attack on American civil liberties in the name of fighting terrorism. From the Patriot Act to torture to drone attacks to the suspension of due process, our government has evolved into the big brother of George Orwell's story 1984. Now, maybe it's okay for the government to monitor civilian communications in order to prevent acts of terror. Maybe it's not. The news that the government is keeping tabs on citizens is really nothing new. It's been going on for a very long time. The problem is that the decision about what crosses the line between the greater good and an invasion of privacy is being made behind closed doors. This is a big conversation and it should be held in a public forum, not secretly. As far as this particular story goes, there's a lot more speculation going on than facts floating around on the internet. If you want to learn more, I recommend that you visit the Electronic, Found Electronic Frontier Foundation at EFF Org. Uh, it's a good place to start and, and if you want to get involved, they are definitely um, the people who will start pushback against this kind of thing. I hope that in the coming days, it'll be shown that the story is blown somewhat out of proportion, but sadly, I wouldn't be surprised if the story turns out to be completely true. I honestly believe that terrorists couldn't hurt us more than we've already hurt ourselves. And while Congress remains locked in petty partisan bickering, there remains little hope in my mind that the pendulum might swing back in favor of privacy and strengthened civil rights. Moving on, I've got an email this week from Stan L who writes, I've got an Android phone, which I use to listen to both music and podcasts. Even though the music and the podcasts are stored in different folders, I sometimes hear podcasts when I wanna to listen to music only. Help. Hi Stan, thanks for your email. You've come to the right place for help. As it turns out, the standard Google Music Player on Android scans all the folders on your device looking for music files. Unfortunately, it can't tell the difference between a music MP3 and a podcast MP3. If you just listen to music on shuffle instead of picking a specific playlist or a specific album, you might get a mix that includes those podcasts. Now, this could be considered a feature, I suppose, but it's obviously not what you want. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a way to tell the built-in player to look at just specific folders for music. 
So you could get around the problem by making playlists, like I mentioned, um, or you could use the player to just listen to specific albums. Neither of these seems like particularly great alternatives. Fortunately, there is a way to tell the built-in music player not to scan certain folders. So if your podcatching software dumps all of its podcasts into one folder, you can prevent that folder from being scanned by your music player. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but I'm going to go through it step by step, and you shouldn't have too much trouble uh, fixing this. Uh, what you need to do is create an empty file called dot no media and copy it to the folder where you don't want the music player to scan it. That flag will tell the music scanning um, subroutine that's in Android uh, to skip that folder when it's doing its scans. It's a little bit involved, but here's what you do. Um, connect your Android device to your Mac or PC. Uh, then use a text editing program to create a new empty file. Uh, in this example, I just right click on the desktop and choose new text document from the context menu. Now, obviously I'm using Windows here. Um, it might, the procedure will probably be a little bit different for Macintosh, but it should work roughly the same way. Just make a new empty text document. And uh, now you can't rename it in Windows um, to dot no media. Um, you might be able to do that on a Mac, I'm not sure. But it doesn't matter. Just copy the file to your Android device and put it inside the folder that you don't want to be scanned. In this example, I'm going to copy the file into my Beyond Pod folder. Beyond Pod is my pod catching program, and I don't want the music app to scan the folder. Once I've copied the file over, I need to rename it using an app on my Android device. Um, that's because Windows won't let me rename it the way I want it, but Android will. Uh, in this example, I'm using Astro File Manager, but there are many free file manager programs for Android that you can download from the Play Store. Simply rename the file to .nomedia, and the .nomedia file should prevent Android from scanning this folder and all the subfolders. As you can see here, from this example, I've still got some podcasts, like this, uh, one of them is uh, This American Life in my music list. So what's going on? Well, copying the no media file over isn't quite enough. You need to coax Android into re-scanning the files on your device. Um, fortunately, this is relatively simple. Go to the settings menu, then click on apps, swipe over to the all tab, and then swipe down to a program called media storage. Click on that, clear the cache and the data. Next, click on force stop. Now power your device off. Once you power it back on, Android will rescan all the folders on your device. It'll take a little while, uh, but you should be good to go after this. Now, when I did this on my device, uh, it took a while for the Google Music program to rescan everything. Um, so you need to be a little bit patient. If Google Play doesn't uh, behave properly after a few minutes, um, I recommend that you do a soft reboot. And if all goes well, this should prevent podcasts and other audio files from being included in your uh, Google Music list. Uh, well, Stan, I hope that helps clear things up for you. And remember, folks, if you have a question, comment, or you just want to talk nerdy, you can visit wetalknerdy.tv and leave a comment or email. Uh, sorry, <laughs> you can leave a comment or email us here at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Now, I'd like to talk to you briefly about our sponsor, UBU Enterprises. Do you need a website for your small business? Maybe you need help managing your business's social media. UBU Enterprises can help you. They have helped me a lot. They took my ideas, added their own flair for design and execution, and they helped me to get my website exactly where I wanted it to be. I could not have done it without them, and the best part is they're still working with me to make sure that my site runs smoothly. Visit them at ubuenterprises.com. In this week's how-to segment, I'd like to take some time to talk about a program called LastPass. I know from the experiences of my own family members that uh, many of you have problems with passwords. My dad, for example, has an Excel spreadsheet on his laptop that contains all his passwords. 
Not only is that file not password protected itself, but if his laptop ever got stolen or lost, he would be in some real trouble. Now, security experts will tell you that you should have different passwords for each website that you use, and those passwords should be consisting of random letters and numbers uh, with some punctuation thrown in. But there's no way that a normal person can remember all those passwords. So a lot of us, myself included, I've been guilty of this in the past, have used passwords that we can remember and we tend to use them over and over. Um, sometimes we write them down or both. Um, this is very insecure. If you use one password for a lot of different websites and somebody discovers that password, they now have access to all those sites. That's bad. Now, you may have discovered that your browser, I know that Chrome and Firefox, and I think Internet Explorer uh, can also do this. I'm not so sure about Safari, uh, and I don't use Opera, so I don't know. But some browsers can remember your passwords. Um, this can be a good way of keeping track of your passwords. Uh, the problem is it only works when you're using that browser. So if you're using Chrome somewhere and you're using Internet Explorer somewhere else, they don't talk to each other as far as uh, what your passwords are. Uh, there are a number of programs that aim to solve the password problem, and some of them are free, and some of them cost money. Um, and I've tried a couple, um, but my favorite is called LastPass. And at least right now, it's free. Now, you may be wondering how they can offer this program for free. Um, they do have a paid version. I think it only costs a dollar a month. Um, but personally, I find that the free version is good enough. Um, if you wanted to use LastPass for an enterprise solution, for example, then you would have to give them some money. Also, LastPass's terms of service uh, have a clue that they may at some point in the future have advertising. But as of right now, uh, they don't have that. Um, LastPass is used by millions of people, and that's a good thing because if we're going to trust them uh, with our most sensitive information, we don't want them to go away. Um, we want a nice, stable company to keep track of all of our stuff. Um, before we talk about why I like and recommend LastPass, let's talk about the downside to any password management program. The first is the trust issue. We are trusting that LastPass or anybody else who's being trusted with your information um, is going to take good care of our data. They say that they'll encrypt our data so that no one can read it. How do we prove that? Well, we really can't. All we can do is trust them. Uh, I've done the research and I believe that LastPass is trustworthy. Lots of security experts recommend LastPass, but you should do your own research until you're satisfied. The second big issue with password managers is that there's a master password to the whole system. In other words, all your passwords are secured using that one password and it's a single point of failure. If you lose your master password or you write it down and it gets stolen, you are in big trouble. But even with those problems, I think the benefits of having a password manager far outweigh the drawbacks. If you're careful, you can secure your master password and remember it, and as long as you don't write it down, you should be in good shape. Now, why would you want to use LastPass? There are three main reasons. One, LastPass is everywhere. LastPass is available as a plugin for all major internet browsers, and it works on mobile platforms as well, including iPhones, iPads, Android, even the Kindle Fire and the Nook uh, can use LastPass. Now, it's implemented on mobile devices in varying ways. For example, on Android, um, the Android version of Chrome doesn't currently support extensions. So LastPass actually has a LastPass browser, and the browser is what interfaces with LastPass. So if you download LastPass for Android, you're going to have a LastPass browser, and if you need to access a website uh, securely, you're going to have to use the LastPass browser instead of the Chrome browser. Uh, although I do think that if you're using Dolphin for Android, there is an extension that you can get. At any rate, um, this is important that LastPass is on so many different devices. If a password manager is going to be seamless for you, it needs to run everywhere. 
and effortlessly. And I think LastPass does a really good job of that. The second thing about password managers, and LastPass in particular, is that it synchronizes your data. It, if you create a new password on your desktop computer, it will automatically sync with your tablet. So if you go to 123.com on your desktop computer, and then you later visit 123.com on your tablet, your tablet will already know what the password is and it will be put in for you automatically when you go to it using the LastPass browser that I was just talking about. You never have to worry about it, which is a really great thing. Now, uh, the third most important thing is that LastPass is pretty easy. It generates random passwords for you and you never have to remember anything other than your one single master password. So if you're convinced now, and you're ready to get started with LastPass, you should set it up on your desktop computer first. In this example, I'm going to show you how to set it up on Windows. The procedures are similar for Macintosh or probably for Linux, but I haven't done it with either of those systems, just with Windows. But the good thing is LastPass has really great documentation, which I'll talk about in just a second. Anyway, point your browser to lastpass.com and click on the download button. LastPass will recommend a version of LastPass for the computer you're using. In most cases, the version that they choose for you will be perfectly fine. Click the download button, and when it's finished downloading, uh, you're ready to install it. Run the installer, and LastPass will install itself on all of your browsers. So whether you prefer Internet Explorer, or Chrome, or Firefox, or something else, you'll have LastPass available on all of those browsers. Now, as part of the LastPass installation process, you're going to be prompted to create your LastPass password. This is your master password, and as the name implies, the last password you're ever going to need to remember. Um, this part is very, very important. This password needs to be something you can remember, and it should also be very secure. So it should be a combination of letters and numbers and punctuation uh, that you can remember uh, but that it's all scrambled up. Um, now, I'm going to show you an easy way of doing that um, so that it's memorable but secure. So start off by thinking of a short phrase that you can remember, something like, until the cows come home. That's a little long, so let's just shorten it to cows come home. This is a good start because it's 12 letters long, and if someone is trying to crack your password, um, English words can be guessed, so we don't want to use cows come home as an English uh, phrase um, because that password can be guessed uh, use what's, using what's called a brute force dictionary attack. A simple way around this is to substitute symbols for letters. It makes the phrase just as um, easy to remember, but much, much harder to guess. So if we add some uppercase letters, uh, like, let's say we capitalize the first word in each of, uh, each of, uh, if we capitalize the first word in the, each phrase, in the phrase, um, and we add some symbols, we could transform cows come home to cows come home. What we do here is substitute zeros for O's, and we capitalize the first letter of each word in and in throwing a question mark at the end, we create a very secure password that's still fairly easy to remember, and it's immune to a dictionary attack because there are no English words in it. When you type your LastPass password uh, <laughs> in, uh, it will give you some feedback on the strength of it. Our version of Cows Come Home is very good. LastPass will ask you to verify your master password and once you've done that, you're ready to go. Now, again, it's important that you resist the attempt to write this down. Now, if you do write it down, put it in a secure place. Um, I myself have a firebox uh, where I keep sensitive documents. That might be an okay place for it. Um, what you might also consider is actually, if you need to write it down, write part of it down in one place and part of it down in another place. And if you ever need to consult that, you'll have two places to look to get your password back together. Again, keeping this secure is the most important thing because 
all of your other passwords depend on this last password. Okay, now when you launch your browser, you should see the LastPass icon. In this case, I'm using Chrome, which required me to activate the LastPass extension before I could use it. Once it's active, you can click on it to access your LastPass vault. On Windows, LastPass also puts an icon on your desktop, and you can also use that to access your vault. The vault is where all your secure information is kept. To turn on LastPass, click on the icon and enter your LastPass password. Now, you have the option of allowing LastPass to remember your password uh, for you. Now, keep in mind that this is a security risk. Only do this on a computer that you own, like your desktop computer. Um, don't do it on mobile devices like laptops or tablets. You should enter your password each time you use it if you're using a device that you take out of the house. I know it's a pain, but it's more secure that way. Otherwise, if you should ever lose that device, someone might have access to all your passwords until you can get back online and change your master password. So from now on, whenever you visit a website and you uh, need to log in with a password, LastPass will offer to remember it for you. A blue bar will appear at the top of your screen, giving you the option to save the site or not. If you choose to save your login information, a new tab will open up showing you the information uh, as it is stored in your LastPass vault. You can review the information and even make some notes if you choose. Once you click save, you're good to go. The next time you visit that website, LastPass will automatically fill in the information for you. The fields it populates are indicated by the little red LastPass icon. Additionally, LastPass has an option that will generate random passwords for you. This is one of the best reasons to use LastPass. You can now easily replace all your old insecure passwords with completely random new ones. If you have a weak or repeated password, the LastPass icon will turn yellow, indicating that you should change your password and generate a new one. LastPass is very powerful, and I've really only just scratched the surface here. If you want to learn more or you need help, visit the LastPass download page. Near the bottom of the page are links to video tutorials, FAQs, uh, the LastPass online user manual, and the LastPass help center. I've been using it for a while now, and I think it's really terrific software, and I highly recommend it to all my friends and family. I'm talking to you, Mom. If you have online accounts, especially banking or other financial holdings, secure password management should be important to you. LastPass can help you keep that information private, and the best part is you only have one password you have to remember. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I'm not really sure when I'm going to be able to put together another show for you. It may be a few weeks, as, like I said, I'm going on vacation for a while. I do plan to keep up the blog, so I'll keep you up to date uh, as to when new episodes will appear. And remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, visit us at wetalknerdy.tv and leave a comment or send us an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you again real soon. Cows come home.